So, uh, so I thought I'd start off this talk by, um, as it's a lightning talk, talk about volcanic lightning. Um, so this is a, a picture from the magnitude, just the day before a magnitude five eruption in Tonga earlier this year in January. Um, so this was just the day before, and uh, from that eruption, which was a magnitude five, we had widespread effects to agriculture in the region from ashfall and the fisheries industry, as well as a global shockwave and tsunami, which led to oil tanker um, uh, problems uh, or slips in Peru, as well as damage to the fishing industry and boats in Japan. So the eruptions I'm going to be talking to you today about are hundreds to 1,000 times larger than this one in Tonga earlier in the year. So how often do these large magnitude eruptions occur? And in this instance, I'll just be using this as a proxy for a global climate altering eruptions, which are magnitude seven and magnitude eight. So magnitude seven eruption from the latest ice core records and from also um, rock record, we can find that they have a probability of about one in seven this century. Whereas a magnitude eight, which is a super eruption, has a, a, a probability of about one in 150 this century. But this produces a combined probability of anything above that climate altering eruption one in six this century. So I'm gonna quickly just go through what the hazards are from both uh, near to the volcano to more of a global sense. So further closer to the volcano, about within 100 kilometers, we're going to be seeing uh, widespread pyroclastic flows, these fast moving avalanches of ash, uh, lahars, which are kind of mud flows, volcanic mud flows, and also heavy ash and pumice fallout from the plume. And this is just an example from Montserrat, uh, where what, what we'd find in these regions very close to the uh, uh, very large eruptions, there's a very high fatality rate. There'd be a mass migration of the wounded. And also, as you can see from that example below, there's mass infrastructure. In the regions a bit further afield, about a thousand kilometers away, we might be seeing ash fall about five to cent 10 centimeters. Um, this image here you can see is of the Toba super eruption. Um, and that caused about that uh, gray area. There is the, is the area which is uh, where five centimeters of ash fall fell out 70,000 years ago. Um, it also, there might be some mass landslides and tsunamis. Obviously the ash fall would lead to mass roof collapse as well. It might antagonize problems such as tsunamis from the mass landslides or even the shock wave. Um, it might antagonize already poor air pollution as well. So there'd be widespread coastal damage and loss from this. Uh, potentially mass roof collapse, depends if it's in a populated area. Um, a lot of relocation and migration from those secondary mud flows and also the ocean life could be severely affected. When we're looking at global sense, we find that these effects more relate to the climate, things like ozone depletion, which might affect uh, agriculture and plant life, precipitation change, which generally reduces, and also abrupt cooling, this volcanic winter effect. This is just an example from um, the last magnitude seven eruption, which was a fairly small magnitude er er eruption, which led to kind of disparate effects uh, of this global winter effect. Some areas were much colder uh, and then some areas remained fairly similar and the same with precipitation. But that last eruption, 1815, led to a decrease in UK's uh, agricultural productivity by about 75%. So what could this mean? In the, in, uh, this could mean widespread famine, water scarcity in particularly vulnerable areas, potential ecological collapse. And with feedbacks, this could also mean uh, cooler temperatures, um, which may remain for hundreds, if not thousands of years, if they influence things like the ice cryogenic cycle or the ocean cycles as well. Now, obviously, uh, since Tambora, you might say that we might be more resilient to some of these volcanic disasters. But on the other side of things, uh, we're a much more globally connected world and we have eight times the uh, population uh, that we did in the 1800s. And this is how all of these different hazards from kind of near field to far field affect our critical system, uh, systems, our modern critical systems, such as severing submarine cables that we rely on for our internet and communication. Um, pumice in the uh, oceans might clog up uh, transport and trade like it had um, um, uh, uh, last year in Japan for a very small eruption and also affecting air travel. It can have a, a destroy power grids and energy lines 
And it can also interact with other um, potential um, uh, reactors. Where these critical systems kind of overlap with concentrated volcanic areas is what's been coined uh, the volcanic pinch points by Lara, Lara's work last year. And this is really where those systems combine. So in areas uh, where volcanoes, so that's a map of the volcanoes in those red triangles. And this is global connectivity with flights and the submarine, uh, what's this one? This is the sea um, transportation routes. Um, this is the submarine cables. And what Lara found is several of these examples, uh, which were particularly vulnerable, such as the Straits of Malacca, it's just in indicated there, uh, roundabout Indonesia, which is the most concentrated volcanic area in the world around Southeast Asia. Uh, and this is an area where 40% of the global trade passes through each year. And, oh, I see yellow card, is that right? Yeah. Uh, and 60% um, and of the world's petroleum. And for the same sort of reasons, the Suez Canal and the Mediterranean and the communication. So how much money or what should we be doing about this? Well, we estimate economic losses. This is a conservative estimate of about 10 trillion. Uh, range, this is from uh, magnitude six eruption estimates, which range from two to seven trillion. Um, so if we use the probabilities as before, um, this would uh, uh, basically a cost benefit analysis would allow us to spend, um, we should be spending something like 1.7 billion each year to reduce um, this risk. What are we actually doing? Well, there's no global funds mitigating extreme risks from governments or philanthropy, no organizations looking into mitigating the effects and very few studying food losses or financial indirect cascading effects. The scientific community lacks any coordination because we're mostly focused on these smaller, more frequent volcanic eruptions. This is in stark contrast with planetary defense where the volcanic risk is hundreds, if, uh, hundreds of times larger for equivalent impacts. We're far, far from prepared for eruptions of this scale, where they'll be, and then how much warning they'll give us and how they'll affect our modern civilization. I'm just gonna, uh, I'll finish there and then I'll just leave, leave this last slide up for questions. Thank you. Always incredibly depressing when someone turns, says, oh, what are people doing about it? Absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> uh, right, any questions in the room? Um, yeah. If there's no, oh, yes. Yeah, Thanks. That was uh, depressing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sam from Caesar. Um, yeah, I'd be curious if you could just talk for like a little bit about the most plausible like good interventions that we have on. So like, imagine this like super volcano erupting. I'm just like, oh, we're like screwed. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I imagine that's not true. What can we do? Yeah, this is a great question because this is the slide that I didn't manage to get to. So thank you very much. Um, so uh, one of the ways that myself and Lara and others are looking into this is kind of focusing on where we should find the, the maximum volcanic risk. And those are places where uh, we should find uh, the volcanoes which are most capable of those large eruptions, uh, where they interact with those globally critical systems and where are the regions which are already vulnerable um, to famine and water scarcity and, and um, uh, you know, poverty and things like that. So if we could focus monitoring efforts to those, some of those volcanoes are not even monitored uh, or have very little monitoring uh, aspects. And that might give us even a few weeks um, to be, uh, prepare us kind of um, in a global sense, uh, uh, you, know, you know, bringing backup generators, water supplies, emergency supplies, alternate trade routes um, to make us a bit more resilient. Um, and then also something that we're looking into uh, uh, is, uh, and with Anders, and this is the next talk really, is looking into direct intervention of, uh, of volcanic uh, uh, hazards. So things like um, stratospheric aerosol removal and also kind of drilling into in and around magma reservoirs, which we're kind of already doing with geothermal energy right now. Okay, great. Well, Mike, I'll take you up on your cue to set us up for the next talk and say thank you so much for, you, for your time. Cheers. Thank you.